This program is transcribed. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. In the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, nearly four million members are banded together to build better futures for themselves and their families. Their reasons for becoming Equitable Society policyholders are many, but certainly among the most unselfish and far-sighted Equitable Society members are those parents who have seen the wisdom of an Equitable Education Fund. Fathers and mothers, in just 14 minutes, the Equitable Society will tell you how to make sure that your children get the funds necessary for the education you want them to have through an equitable education fund. Tonight's FBI file, The Telltale Bracelet. The summer vacation period is drawing to a close, and throughout the nation, businessmen are getting ready for the fall season. Americans earn their daily bread in an endless variety of ways, and in almost every one of those pursuits, there is a seasonal fluctuation. But there is at least one business in the United States which does not depend for its revenue on any such variable circumstances as the weather. That business is crime. Criminals are reaping a tremendous harvest in this country. To tell you one figure out of the welter gathered by your FBI will not tell you the whole story, but it may give you some idea of the magnitude of criminal operations in the United States in the past 12 months. In that time, criminals stole property valued at a total of more than $113 million, or almost $10 million a month. Of that amount, more than $9 million represented the value of stolen jewelry, a sum which puts jewel theft into the category of big business. This would be a somber report if the theft of jewels was diminishing. The shocking fact that it is rising and the end is nowhere in sight. Tonight's file opens in a small neighborhood theater in a Connecticut city. It is early afternoon. In a shabby dressing room of this playhouse, Jay and Ruth Brooks, a comedy team, are making up for the first of their daily performances. Ruth? Yeah? Did I tell you what I told the manager about this dressing room? No. I walked right up to him and I said, Piermont, who's got top billing on this bill? He says, you and your wife have. So I said, well, I'm glad you recognize that by having our dressing room fixed. And he says, what do you mean fixed? I says, you put a fresh coat of dirt on the walls. <laughs> well, come on, kid, laugh it up. What's the matter? That joke is too true. This is such a crumby place. Oh, Ruthie, we needed a day to break in the new routines. Besides, we're getting top billing, ain't we? That all helps for what I got in mind. Oh, what's that? That story I showed you in Variety about television. You know, how they need class acts like ours? Is that what it says in Variety? Sure. They figure it just like I do. They figure that television has got to have a beautiful Jay. name. And a... What? Listen. That's the music for the three balls of fire. That means they're on. I thought you spoke to the manager about them. I did. I said to him, Piermont, how can you expect us to get any last following a strip tease act? What'd he say? Well, what could he say? We're the headliners, ain't we? Top billing? Why are we still following them? Well, look, Piermont couldn't re-routine the bill on such short notice. But after this first show, he'll put them on behind us. Why couldn't he do oh, it now? Oh, honey, forget it, will you? We got important things to think about. There may be television scouts out front. Oh. Well, how do I look? Sensational. Like the bracelet? Where'd you get it? I borrowed it from Edna. Well, that's kind of junky. But leave it on. Come on. 
Let's get out on stage. You think there'll really be television scouts out there? Sure. Oh, I hope I remember the new routine. Well, what if you don't? Remember me? <laughs> Ad lib Sam. Oh, but I'm not oh, as good as. Stop worrying. Come on, let's go down now and murder the people. Edna. Edna. That you, Tommy? Yeah. Be right with you. Uh, look, honey, I, I can't stay long. I thought we were going out. Well, we were, but uh, something's happened. Uh, look, come here, will you? What is it? What's the matter? Edna, uh, first of all, I want you to know I ain't an Indian giver. When I give somebody a present, it's a present for them to keep. You understand what I mean? Yeah. But um, something's come up on that last stuff I gave you. Oh, you mean the bracelet? Yeah, and the two rings. Well? Well... To tell you the truth, Edna, that, that stuff didn't belong to me. I, I, I borrowed it. You borrowed junk like that? That ain't junk. The bracelet and those two rings happen to be worth about 12 Gs. Are you kidding? No. Who'd you borrow it from? Eddie Marshall. The racket guy? Yeah. Oh, why'd he lend it to you? Well, he didn't actually lend it. He, uh, he gave it to me to hold for him when he got picked up by the cops. Huh? So you play the big guy and give it to me. Well, Edna, at the time, I figured you could keep it. Why? Well, Marshall figured to be convicted and get ten years. Somehow he beat the rap. Now he's loose and I got word he wants to see me. So be a good kid and let me have it back, huh? I haven't got it. What? Not here. Well, where is it? I loaned it to a friend of mine. Oh. Ruth Brooks. The, the little vaudeville dame? Yeah. Well, go and get it right back. I can't. Why not? Act went out of town. Where? I don't know. Oh, fine. Look, Edna, this marshal's a real bad guy. Well, why didn't you think of that when you gave me the present? Oh, stop, will you? We've got to find this Brooks Damon finder fast. I have to get that stuff back tonight. Meanwhile, at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is approached by Agent Leo Schuyler. Oh, Jim, that's probably the message hmm? I left for you. Oh, hi, Leo. I just missed you when you went out for lunch. I went out a little early, Leo. I wanted to stop by police headquarters. On the Madison case? No, the supervisor got a call this morning from one of the detectives down at headquarters about some stolen jewelry. Well, that's the case I've been assigned to work on with you. Oh, good. Uh, can you fill me in on the background? Well, I don't know too much about it myself yet, but I'll give you everything we've got. Okay. A woman named Mrs. Jenkins in Philadelphia had some jewelry stolen a couple of months ago. Uh-huh. She used to live in New York, and she still reads the New York papers pretty regularly. One of the papers had a picture of a society girl and a boyfriend dancing at one of the local nightclubs. Yes? Well, behind them in the picture is another couple. The girl's back is to the camera, so we don't know who she is. But on her wrist is a bracelet that was stolen from Mrs. Jenkins. How does she know it's hers, Jeff? Because it was designed exclusively for her, and it's supposed to be the only one of its kind. I see. The face of the man, the one who's dancing with the girl, is very distinguishable. Well, maybe somebody around the nightclub knows who he is. Well, I called the nightclub press agent. He came into the office. He's there every night, and he said he'd never seen the man before. Hmm. Well, maybe one of the waiters knows him. Yeah, it's possible. I'm having a couple of the prints of the picture blown up. Will you take one of them over to the club, Leo? Check with the waiters and the captains? Sure. I'll stay here and go over the files. I want to see if they can tell us the identity of the man in the picture. Me, me, me. <coughs> me, da, ha, 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 me, ha. Uh, who's there? Me? Who else? Oh, I thought maybe it was Piermont, the manager. Figured he might be coming back to apologize. For what? Oh, for the run-in I had with him. Where you been all this time? There was a phone call for me out in the box office. You knew that's where I went. Oh, yeah, yeah. Who was it? It was Edna Gilmer. She was calling long distance from New York. Well, what did she want? It was about that bracelet and those rings she loaned me. She wants them back. She's sending her boyfriend, Tommy, up here for them tonight. Well, why all the hurry? She said her boyfriend, Tommy, was mad at her because she wasn't wearing the stuff. Uh, why don't he stop trying to be Humphrey Bogart? Jay, why'd you have a run-in with Mr. Piermont? Oh, it was about making us follow them three balls of fire. Wouldn't he change us? Uh, not at first. What do you mean? Well, he tried to wiggle out of it. He had some phony excuse about us not getting enough laughs the first show. We didn't get many. Well, that's because there wasn't many customers. That's what I told the guy. I said, you get us some customers, we'll get you the laughs. 
You notice how the musicians went for us, don't you? They were screaming. There were only three of them. Well, who cares how many? Those Petrilla guys are helped. Oh, brother, and they're plenty hep, too. They love this smart material. Look, how many times do I have to tell you, honey? This is a class act. We're building it for television, not the yokels in this town. Now, come on, hurry up and change. We're on in ten minutes. Oh, Jim. Yes, Leo? I went to that nightclub. No one could identify the man in the picture. Oh, I called you at the club, but you'd already left. We found out who he is. Oh, good. His picture turned up in the files. He's a petty larceny thief named Tom Wells. Oh, he shouldn't be too tough to find. Oh, not if he's still in town. He may have gone under, though, when the picture appeared in the paper. That's true. In any event, we've sent out a new alarm on him. Oh, here, I... I've got his record here. Have you had a chance to study it? Yeah. Well, I can't see how he could have been mixed up in the jewel robbery. You said he was a thief, didn't you? Yes, but he's never been arrested for stealing jewelry. I, I think this Jenkins job is a little out of his league. Why? Well, three of his arrests have been for booking policy numbers. And all the rest here are for peddling punch boards to high school kids. But there's no denying that the bracelet in this picture is the one that was stolen from Mrs. Jenkins. Oh, no, it's true enough. The jeweler who made the bracelet for Mrs. Jenkins positively identified it. Jim, I assume the police have already checked on the address Wells gave them when he was last arrested. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they have. It's a rooming house, and Wells did not return there after he served his time. The only thing to do now, Leo, is hope we get an answer on that alarm. Oh, Jay. Why? I just can't seem to get this break right. Well, you better not fool around with it anymore now, honey. We're on in a few minutes. On again so soon? Uh-huh. We were just off an hour ago. How many shows are we doing here a day? Six. Six? Well, we get a break because we're headliners. The other acts are doing seven. That's on weekdays. Of course, on Sundays you can't tell. Jay. Huh? Do you hear that? Hey, yeah. That's the music for them striptease dames. Thought we were supposed to be on ahead of them. Yeah, that's what that Piermont told me. How do you like that guy? No wonder Vaudeville is dead. That's probably him with another bum excuse. Yeah. Come in. Ruth Brooks in here. Oh, hi, Edna. Oh, come in. Thanks. Oh, Jay, you remember Edna. Yeah, sure. Hi. I'd ask you to sit down, Edna, except there ain't another chair. If we had another chair, where'd we put it? On my shoulders? Oh, no, Jay. Uh, I'm fed up with the way we've been treated around here. Gee, I didn't expect you, Edna. I thought your boyfriend was coming to see us. I decided to come myself. How'd you know where we were playing? Called up your agent. Look, have you got the bracelet and the rings? Oh, yeah, sure. Could I have money? Oh, they're not here. Huh? I went back to the hotel after the last show. I left them there. Oh, well, let's go over and get them. Okay. Right after this show. Look, I haven't got time to wait. Let's go now. She can't go now, Edna. We're almost on. She's got to. I can't wait. Why not? I, uh, well, if you must know, that bracelet and those rings are real. What? Yeah. Yeah, they're worth 12000 Oh, my. I got to get them in a hurry. Does Tommy want them back? He isn't interested in them anymore. Tommy was killed this afternoon. <laughs> We will return in just a moment to tonight's case from the files of your FBI. Soon, from hundreds of well-loved college halls, the bells will ring out to welcome nearly two and a half million young Americans. But what about the boys and girls who are forced by fate to turn a deaf ear to the college bells? Many of them with excellent records in high school. Youngsters well qualified for college, but who for one reason or another won't get the chance. Believe me, Mr. Keating, they're never going to say that of my boy. I've made certain that he'll have the money to go, regardless of what happens to me. After hearing you talk about an equitable education fund last week, I got in touch with my equitable society representative and signed up. Fine, Norman. You'll never regret that move, and neither will that boy of yours. For members of this audience who didn't hear this program last week, 
I'll repeat some of the advantages of an equitable education fund as offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. First, you start when your children are young and spread their educational costs over 10 or 15 years instead of taking a licking in four. Second, when your boy or girl is ready for education, the money is ready and waiting for him right there in the Equitable Education Fund. Third, this equitable plan works whether you live or die. If you are totally or permanently disabled, the fund continues to build up without any further payments. If you die, the education fund becomes fully established immediately. That's what sold me, Mr. Keating. That's why I decided to see my Equitable Society representative. And I earnestly urge every forethoughtful father or mother to do likewise, or to send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Yes, once you set up an Equitable Education Fund... You can be sure that when the college bells are ringing for the class of 1958 or 65, your boy or girl will be able to answer the call. And now back to tonight's file, The Telltale Bracelet. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI gives ample illustration of the basic inherent difference between the criminal and the decent citizen. The decent citizen, upon finding himself in possession of something that does not rightfully belong to him, makes every attempt to see that the property is returned to its owner. The criminal, on the other hand, has no such impulse. The decent citizen is one who recognizes the temptation of easy gain for what it is and has the strength to resist. The criminal likewise recognizes the temptation and succumbs because the emotion which rules his every move is greed. To the criminal, getting something for nothing is the only important thing, for it is the keystone upon which his entire world is built. What his consuming greed and his overpowering egomania prevent the criminal from knowing is that getting something for nothing is an impossibility and that you always pay for what you get. Another thing the criminal never learns until too late is that the price to him is always high, often his very life. Tonight's file continues in the local FBI field office. Jim. Oh, Jim. Yes, Leo. <laughs> I just about given up on you. Oh, I'm sorry, Leo. I should have called. I've been down at the morgue. On what? A police reported a killing this afternoon. It turned out to be our missing suspect, Tommy Wells. Oh. What happened? Well, the coroner said Wells had been beaten to death at his hotel with a blunt instrument. Possibly the butt of a gun. Any leads? No. No, nothing so far. Well, it's not going to be easy to find out who that girl in the picture was now. Oh, I think I know her. Really? Yeah, there were three pictures of the same girl in Wells' room at the hotel. In every one of the pictures, she's wearing her hair in an upsweep. That's the way the girl in the newspaper picture was wearing her hair, too. Yeah, I know. I checked around the hotel, and the bell captain told me this was the only girl he ever saw Wells with. Did he know who the girl is? No, but the pictures were all made by the black and white studios. I took them down there, and they identified the girl as Edna Gilmer. Ah. Did they know where Miss Gilmer lives? Yes, they gave me her address, but when I checked, I found out she'd left town. She's gone to Hartford, Connecticut, according to her landlady. Well, Jim, we know her name, and we know what she looks like. I don't think we'll have too much trouble finding her. I hope not. I've already notified the police up there to be on the lookout for her. What do we do now, Jim? As soon as we get an okay, we go to Hartford. <laughs> Edna, did I hear you right? Did you say that Tommy was killed? Yeah. How? Oh. He was beaten to death. By who? I think it was a man named Eddie Marshall. Well, who's he? A racket guy. Why did he kill Tommy? On account of the jewelry. What? It belonged to Marshall. Tommy had no right to give it to me. Oh. Are the police looking for Marshall? I don't know. Well, didn't you tell them about him? No. Why not? That's their business. Oh, but Edna... Look, we're wasting time. Let's go to the hotel and get the bracelet and rings. Oh, we told you, Edna, we're due on stage. Edna, what do you plan to do with the stuff when you get it? Turn it over to the police? Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, then what's the hurry? I... Look, I might as well tell you something. Eddie Marshall is smart to the fact that I know where the jewelry is. So? There's also a very good chance that he followed me up here to Hartford. You mean followed you here to us? Yes. 
When he finds out that you've got the stuff, you're in it, too. Oh. So if you want to be in the clear, let's get over to your hotel. You're on. We're on, he said. Yeah. What'll we do? We do with the act. Now, wait a minute. We've got to, Edna. Come on, Ruth. We'll sure get a lot of laughs this show. Stop the music. What's the matter now? A very funny thing happened to me tonight while I was on my way to the theater. It did? What's that? Ran into an old friend of mine. He said to me, Jay, I have never been so happy in my life. My wife's an angel. And what did you say to him? I said, you're lucky. <laughs> Mine's still alive. Stop the music. Uh, what did you do that for? I wanted to tell you something. I got a letter from my mother. She said there's only one way to make sure of having your husband home on Sunday. How? Shoot him Saturday night. Yuck, 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 yuck. What a dog that was. Should we take a bow? Yeah, we'd better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, brother, I'm glad that one's over. What do we do now, Joe? About what? That gangster. Oh, honey, don't worry about him. But Edna said he probably followed her here. Oh, she's just guessing about him. Come on, let's go to the dressing room. She might be guessing right, Jay. Look. Tell you what we'll do. We go back to the hotel, get the jewelry, then take Edna down to the police station and explain the whole thing. Suppose Edna's gone. Then we'll take the jewelry down to the police ourselves. Go ahead, honey. Okay. Well, Edna, I got the whole thing figured out. We go to the hotel, get the jewelry, then we go to the police station. You ain't huh? going no place. Edna, who's he? That's Eddie Marshall. <laughs> Leo, Leo, over here. All right, Jim. Oh, brother, I'm tired. Any luck, Leo? I'm afraid not, Jim. What did you cover? Just about all of Hartford. No. I checked the railroad station, bus depots, cab drivers. Yeah, how about the airport? No luck there, either. You know, she probably drove up here. Uh, how did you make out of the hotel check? I didn't do any better than you did. This hotel was the last one on our list. Mm. What do we do now, Jim? Well, let's reconstruct this thing, huh? Okay. I think it's safe to assume that she was coming here to Hartford for a specific reason, to see someone. Yes. Now, she's not staying at a hotel, so it's probable that her visit here is going to be a short one. Which makes it that much harder. There are about 200,000 people in Hartford, Jim. If she did come to visit someone, we have a pretty wide choice. Yeah, but the field is narrower than that. Don't forget her landlady did tell us she came up here to see someone named Brooks. We've called every Brooks in the phone book. Yeah. yeah. You know, if we only knew her motive for coming here... Leo... Why should an out-of-work chorus girl who comes from Council Bluffs, Iowa, suddenly leave New York for Hartford, Connecticut, and then disappear? Mm. Well, Jim, if we could... Hey, go... wait a minute. What? I know one angle we haven't explored. Come on. Where are you going? Over to the newsstand. We're buying a Hartford paper. So, this is Mr. Marshall. That's right. Well, uh, pleased to make your acquaintance, Mr. Marshall. Uh, you ever have any relatives in Vaudeville? Used to be an act called... Marshall I ain't Kirk interested. And... Look, Mr. Marshall, this dressing room's kind of small. And we got to change I all. just want one thing. What's that? Jewelry. A bracelet and two rings. Well, we don't know what you're talking about, Mr. Marshall. He knows you got them. Oh. Where are they? They're over at the hotel. All right, let's go over there. Well, we, we can't go like this. Why not? With his zoot coat and these funny shoes? <laughs> Gee, I, I don't want people laughing at me. Nobody will laugh at you, brother. I know, I just seen you right. 
What do you mean by that? Look, I got a gun here. I don't care what you got. Were you panning the axe? Mac, I'm warning you. Jay Doozy says. Honey, he's knocking the axe. He's going to use the gun, Jay. No, he isn't. Ah. Let it fall, Marshal. Go on. Drop it, I said. Uh, well, who are you? We're special agents of the FBI. <gasps> we were looking for Miss Gilmer here. Her landlady told us that she'd come to Hartford to see a Mrs. Brooks. You were difficult to locate until we figured that because she's in show business, she might be visiting somebody in a theater here. So we bought the local paper and looked at the amusement page to see what was playing. And you saw our name. That's right, in the ad for this theater. You see, Ruth? That's what I've been telling you. That's how important top billing is. Eddie Marshall was turned over to local authorities, prosecuted, convicted, and sentenced to be executed for the murder of Tom Wells. And thus, your FBI closed another case. Closed another case and thereby solved two crimes. The Philadelphia jewel theft and the murder of Tom Wells. It is not an uncommon occurrence for the special agents of your FBI to solve more than one crime with one arrest. Because it is an axiom among law enforcement officers that one crime invariably leads to another. Sometimes those early crimes are minor. But however trivial they may appear to be, and however far from you they may occur... They affect you directly. They affect you because the commission of every crime is an attack against law and order. And should those attacks ever prove to be overwhelming, it would mean an end to your personal liberties and to every shred of your security. That is why the battle against crime, a battle which your FBI fights 24 hours a day, is your battle too. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now I have just 25 seconds to answer one last question on the Equitable Education Fund. Mr. Keating, suppose I start one of those funds for my daughter. Then, when she gets to be 18, she gets married instead of going to college. What happens then? Well, that's strictly up to you. The money is yours. You can use it to pay for your daughter's trousseau and wedding or for any purpose you see fit. So, no matter what happens, it's a good idea to see your Equitable Society representative soon. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The exciting account of a relentless search for an international killer. Its subject, impersonation. Its title, The Great Deception. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Great Deception on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.